Today, I have a pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Gunjan Bagla. Gunjan is joining us from LA and uh, who will be the moderator uh, for this session. Over to you, Gunjan. Thank you so much, Viti. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so Sandi mentioned in the beginning of this uh, event that uh, one of our goals is to highlight India and bring it into the mainstream of the United States. Uh, about a year ago, I was at a I was invited to run a workshop for top executives at a major company uh, whose products many of you probably have in your homes or your car. And they wanted me to run an India business workshop. And when I arrived at that facility, my host walked me through to their main conference room. And on the way, I noticed all of these bays of uh, cubicles and offices, which were kind of separated by rows and rows of file cabinets. And I was thinking, hey, here's such a modern advanced company. And just in idle conversation, I said, oh, so you're using your uh, old file cabinets as uh, wall separators. And he said, oh, no, no, we store all our drawings and documents and contracts in there. And I said, oh my God, this company, for, for this company, digital transformation really means what most people did in their 1980s or 1990s, where they started going to computerized records and getting rid of file cabinets. So digital transformation has been with us for a long time. Uh, uh, since we are talking about India uh, and the energy business, let me start with something that, uh, that has come up a lot in the Q&A box here. Uh, and let me frame it this way. The pandemic uh, shutdown started in March. And shortly after that, India's largest energy company, Reliance, announced a $6 billion investment from Facebook, followed by a series of other investments where this oil company is transforming itself into a data and, and uh, really internet company, if you will. They've received $25 billion of investment. And so my question to you, Sandeep, is, uh, Broadly speaking, for people who are in India, they're watching this tremendous digital transformation that Mukesh Ambani has created. But what about the rest of India? What, what do you think will happen with people running businesses and working at companies in India? What does digital transformation mean to our attendees who are joining from India? Yeah, it, it is it is amazing uh, how much, uh, how much uh, uh, investments are going into India. And uh, you know the challenge uh, you you run into with with a lot of um, you know the investments that are happening even worldwide right now is uh, they're fairly uh, narrow and fairly limited uh, to to certain uh, mega companies and uh, that that appears to be the trend. Um, it is uh, disproportionately impacting uh, smaller businesses, um, but you know what I would what I would maybe say very broadly without going specific uh, specifically to what's going on in India, um, but but the but the ability to transform yourself digitally um, is is almost uh, an existential um, uh, need now. Uh, and again, you know that's uh, the the businesses that survive will continue to be those businesses that you know take a look at this uh, you know almost uh, darwinian event that we are going through and come out at the other end having transformed themselves in one way or the other if you're a very small business and you can't really afford all the all the technology um, you know i am i am amazed at how much new technology is is coming about uh, that is helping businesses, uh, you know, um, become digital purveyors. You know, for for those of you who might have seen uh, Amazon's Prime Day, I think they were highlighting how uh, many small businesses really got uh, got an advantage, uh, you know, selling their products on their platform. So, you know, uh, th these marketplaces are being created worldwide, where people can, uh, you know sell their products and transform themselves without actually having the, the resources themselves. Um, I think yeah. that's where that's where the Delta is going to be. There are going to be businesses that are going to just have to take the marketplaces and platforms that are available. And unfortunately, some of the economic rents might go to the platform uh, you know, providers. 
But uh, if you want to keep the economic rent to yourself, you you really have to do it yourself then. Uh, yeah, and, so, and I'll have so a follow-up no... question on that subject in a moment for, for you, Sandeep. Uh, Vimal, do you want to add anything to that? Well, uh, from a, uh, I don't, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, very familiar with the Indian market. The question you asked about reliance and uh, moving to data, I will not be able to answer that. But I can tell you this: the from a digital transformation, I, I see some questions coming through as what is so new about digital transformation? It's been going on for uh, many years. Well, it has, but if you think about the, 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 the transformations that used to happen were a gradual, a gradual smooth curve going up. But lately what you've seen since 2000, I would say since the World Wide Web came along, the transformations are happening as a step function. The first with the World Wide Web followed by 2007 when the iPhone was introduced, I think that actually unleashed a market power that was, uh, that was not available before. The app producers, you know, you had, you had 14 year olds writing apps for iPhones, which, uh, and there were 14 year olds making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year using, uh, using the iPhone as a platform. That kind of transformation had never, that, that's the kind of transformation we are talking about. And now we are on the verge of, a, of a, another step function, which is uh, with the cloud computing, cloud storage, the IoT devices, all of that, is going to is is going to trigger another uh, a huge change. Um, you saw with the uh, just like you saw with the apps on iPhones and the gig economy that was created. The whole cloud platform is going to create something that is that has not been known before, where every small business will have similar computing power and services at their fingertips that larger corporations were able, were able to. To afford, so okay. I can see how that would actually translate to something big, even in countries like India and other other plus parts of the world. All right. Hey, thank you so much, Vimal. Thank you. Uh, we are getting a full range of questions here, so I'm going to try and select the ones that are most relevant to digital transformation. And uh, Sandeep, you mentioned real time and transparent as being a very important component of uh, the work that that you have done at your company. And then we heard from Bimal about uh, how they are able to transmit the MIDI streams in real time, where you can now essentially have Elton John performing the piano in your, in your living room. Right. Uh, so the questions are coming up about uh, how did you implement the real time technology? And did you, uh, in Sandeep's case, did you do all the programming yourself or did you use uh, uh, you know, outside uh, experts and software providers? to develop that? Yeah, so I can answer that. Uh, for us, um, everything is proprietary. We built all the software ourselves. We've got, uh, you know, like I said, we're almost like uh, within within uh, an oil and gas company sits a small uh, software company. You know, we've got about 150 software engineers and data engineers and data scientists. The trick really for us has been, um, you know, because we don't sell outside EOG, our products are not things that other corporations use. So it's an in-house uh, technology. We partner up with the engineers to design custom solutions. So even the real-time data that's coming in, um, we work with all our engineers to have them figure out, well, I'll give you an example. So, you know, a classic thing is a drilling rig. Well, a drilling rig will, will have maybe 80 to 120 different streams of data that give us some information as to exactly how the, the, the rig is operating. So all of that stuff streams in and we have our own uh, black boxes, essentially they're IOT devices with their own comm equipment uh, that go and jack in into the, into the drilling rig and send us the data. So the simple answer to you is like, uh, the bulk of uh, our technology is developed in-house and we don't really use any third party products necessarily. So if we have people from TCS and Wipro on the call, uh, you don't really want to talk to them, huh? That, that's, not, that's not quite true. Um, <laughs> I think uh, what I would say is we have a huge number of business partners, uh, several of them in India, uh, that, that help us with some of this uh, software development. I think maybe, uh, maybe my, my question really, uh, had, my answer had more to do with, we, we are uh, immense consumers of the best talent that the world has. Uh, not necessarily for uh, software necessarily that has been produced, uh, commercial software, but people, uh, that is the backbone. And, and we, we, we try and find the best talent worldwide to help us build our, our tools. 
Okay, awesome. And that actually is a great segue to the next question. Uh, you know, when the average person hears about digital transformation and innovation, they often think that it's centered around Silicon Valley. And I want everyone in the audience to notice that neither of our speakers are from Silicon Valley. And uh, both of them have engineered, you know, tremendous transformation within their own companies. And so my question to both of you is that when you are looking for this talent to be able to bring into your company or into your own, uh, into your own organization, how do you compete with the Amazons and the Facebooks and the uh, Googles of the world? How do you attract the best talent? And, and I'll ask Vimal to go first and then briefly Sandeep, if you can say a word or two. And please keep your answers short so we can get more questions in. All right. The short answer to your question about attracting talent from uh, Google's or Amazon's is we do not even try to compete with them, uh, just because we cannot. Right. So what our um, the one of the things we did at least at Yamaha was uh, uh, we have. So this is something that may come across as very strange to you. We have very low turnover in IT at Yamaha. We, uh, it is the average tenure of the folks in IT is about fifteen years in at Yamaha. The, which, as you know, for IT, it is a that is a very unusual situation. So one of the things I committed to very early on to all of all of the staff inside of IT was, I cannot guarantee you a job, but I can guarantee that you will always be able to find a job. In other words, we will give you the kind of experience and uh, uh, activities that that at, at Yamaha that if, if ever you want to go look out look for a job, you will have the ability to go find a job anywhere. In this, in in the country, and at any time, um, getting now, you know, part of part of the answer to your question lies in uh, the answer to the previous question. We we, we have um, we use resources from outside. We use outside services for a lot of the back office activity from a not so much from a planning, a strategy, or a design perspective, but from an actual doing perspective. So coding, etc., all of that is done by outside resources. All of the planning strategic thinking, all of the planning is done by our own people inside uh, Yamaha. But for all product related uh, uh, programming or product related activity, all of that is proprietary, all of that is in-house, it's never outsourced because it is our intellectual property. I, I, I hope that answers okay. your question. Thank you. Sandeep, do you want to say something we, quickly about the subject? I will. Um, actually, we, we go head to head with, uh, with Google and Apple and uh, Facebook um, we get a lot of our um, young graduates from the University of Texas at Austin. And as you know, all the big, uh, big uh, name players have moved to Austin. So it's a, it's a, it's, it is definitely a battle. We've, we've got our fair share of people. And the only reason we are able to compete against some of the big uh, tech people is the kind of work that the guys get to do, uh, uh, the young men and women that come join us, because they're working on industrial applications. They're, they're working on things that have to do with, uh, with uh, you know, making stuff, you know, products, not sales necessarily or search related type products. So I think it's the kind of work that attracts the kind of people that, that join EOG. Um, so that, that I'll leave it uh, at that. Okay. So do you try to hire people from the IITs directly into your company? We have not done that yet, but you know, I would love to do that. Uh, it, it's, I'm, I am, um, uh, I'm sorry to say that I have not, but that would be a, a great, uh, great channel that I would love to love to start investigating. Okay. Awesome, awesome. Well, we have some questions about security, uh, uh, and it was directed at Vimal. But either of you can answer. How, when you are when you are going into a mobile situation where everybody who works for you can access the data uh, from wherever they happen to be, how do you set up a system? to make sure that the wrong people don't get access to your data. Uh, so if you can give a brief answer to that, Vimal, that would be great. Yep. Yeah, so that's a good point. That is actually by far the most difficult part about uh, using public uh, in public cloud infrastructure. So there are a few, there is, of course, I won't go into the technical details of how we achieve that. We use, one of the things we do is we use a Citrix VDI uh, for presenting all the systems. So. Uh, Access to that is controlled by our own uh, internal LDAP. The second piece is all of our data is encrypted, whether whether it's at rest or uh, or it's or, or in motion, it's all encrypted. And there are there are network able abilities to separate the VLANs so that access from uh, user access is restricted to a single VLAN. 
uh, and the core systems are separated where uh, we do not, there, there is no access, direct access to any of the core systems. Um, for ad administrative access, we use at this time two-factor authentication for all administrative access to all of our systems. And the AWS console is uh, the restriction, there is highly restricted access to the AWS console. So uh, that's, does that actually mitigate all of the risk? As you know, that's not never possible. Our attempt is every day, we are, our main goal is to protect our data. And every day there are new things that we have to protect against. So that's my answer. Okay. Um, so question for both of you, uh, as you embarked on this journey towards digital transformation, uh, there may have been some resistance from some parts of your company. Uh, and I know Sandeep, you talked about the culture in your company, uh, but can you give us uh, some examples of how you dealt with uh, pushback and uh, how, how, what would be your advice for others uh, in that situation? Sure. I think the biggest pushback that we, we had was, uh, was the whole purpose from day one was to make uh, things transparent. And uh, there's just a human tendency to not have the CEO of the company take a look at uh, costs, uh, you know, maybe going over the budget or when things are not working, working well. Right. Um, but it was very, very critical to us that we stay faithful to the whole transparency because we're running a very decentralized business. So I think that was the biggest pushback. But what happens is when you make uh, data transparent, bad data quickly becomes good data. Um, and it actually spurs the kind of uh, <clears throat> innovation that I was talking about. Well, I'll give you a very small example. Uh, we changed the metric at which we were uh, ranking investments. So instead of ranking investments at you know, higher oil price, we said every investment needs to be made at $40 oil so that you know, even in low oil prices, we can be successful. And I guarantee you, as soon as we did that, a lot of our projects suddenly became not that economic, but the CEO could see that, the managers could see it. And within about a year, uh, the whole business changed to where, you know, costs came down and, uh, and people were going ahead and, and investing in projects that were very profitable at $40 oil. So, so transparency is, was probably the biggest pushback, but, uh, but now that everybody sees the benefit of it, you know, we're, we're back to a happy place. Got it, okay. So we are coming up on uh, 9.30 and if some people want to uh, sign out at this point, that's fine, but we will continue the Q&A. There's lots of good questions coming up and I do want to get to as many of them as possible. Um, so give me a moment here to try and prioritize them. There's a whole series of questions relating to uh, sustainability and, and so on, which are not necessarily connected to digital transformation, but we have so many of them that I'm going to try and uh, summarize a couple of them. So first of all, from Rakesh Sharma in New York is a question about, uh, you know, what do you exactly mean by sustainability in your business, uh, Sandeep? Yeah. So a couple of things, you know, uh, you know, many, and I've read many of the comments, uh, and of course, you know, there's uh, different perspectives of the role of fossil fuels going into the future. But, <clears throat> but let, me, let me talk about wh what we mean by sustainability. And I'll talk about a few things. The first one is to make sure that our operations are as, as environmentally benign as we can possibly make it. So I'll give you one example that in the United States is a big issue, which is flaring of gas in the process of, of, uh, of uh, you know, producing uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, it's a big deal. Um, the EOG's flaring intensity is, uh, you know, we capture 99.95% or most of our natural gas. And the reason for that is because we don't believe in uh, exposing uh, uh, gas into the atmosphere. And so we've made investments to go ahead and capture it. And even if there are uh, uh, market conditions that, uh, that you know, uh, downstream that impact us, we're able to take care of it. So, so sustainability to us means being making investments so that our environmental footprint is very, very small. Also, one of the things that we've been able to do is we use a lot of water. And so we've had to build an entire uh, set of technologies around managing water so that we're not impacting other uh, communities that need access to maybe say fresh water. 
So we use a lot of water that is uh, not used by you know uh, communities uh, for you know purposes like drinking, agriculture, etc. So you know we 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 require uh, many resources in our business, but sustainability is to try and invest in such a way that you minimize the impact to the environment. Awesome. So uh, uh, most of the people attending this call are probably not in the music business and not in the energy business, but I do want to note that virtually everything that both of you are saying is applicable to any kind of industry, any kind of business. And, uh, and I think we are all getting some great takeaways. Uh, let me continue with the questions here. Uh, so from Sabrish in Boston, who works for Microsoft, there's a question about what digital transformation needs are conspicuously not being addressed by current solutions. So for you, for both of you, I guess, uh, what, what do you what products or the tools or technologies do you wish you had that you don't have now? What are your unmet needs? I guess. You know, I, I think I'm not sure that I, I, I would say that there's anything that is uh, unmet at this point in time. Uh, from my perspective, maybe Vimal has a, a different answer. Um, you know, our business partners are pretty good. I think we, we, we do reach out to some, uh, some very innovative companies. I was just speaking with a, with a company um, in, uh, in uh, Oxford uh, yesterday, uh, talking to their CEO on some cybersecurity uh, initiatives that we're trying to do. My, my simple answer is, I think there's a lot of technology out there in the world. It's, uh, it's really a matter of whether we can uh, get in early, partner up with some people so that we can customize it for our, for our own needs. Yeah, okay, all right, thanks. So um, uh, what I would say from, you remember what I mentioned about uh, our goal with uh, transformation, long-term goal and uh, vision is that our revenues should be insulated from disruption of the supply chain and it should only be dependent upon the market demand. So that's in order for that to actually happen, we would have to have uh, technologies that can replace the, the core piece of the supply chain, which is transportation. At this time, there is no technology that can actually insulate us from disruptions in transportation. I would say that's, we can monitor transportation. We can look at what's going on inside of a container, in a truck or on a ship. But if, if that transportation, the vehicle itself breaks down or the, they're taken off the road, we really have no way to insulate against that for right now. At some point, maybe there will be. But at this point, we can't think of one for hard goods deliveries. That's great. I'm sure there's someone in the audience who's going to take down that idea. And maybe we'll see a startup or a service coming through in, in a year or That'd two to fantastic. address that very situation. So thank you very yeah. much for that. Um, we have a question from, from Viti Bindra for Sandeep. Uh, how the divergence and imbalance in the ONG ecosystem is affecting the EPC industry, the uh, engineering uh, procurement construction industry, I guess, uh, on a global platform? Uh, yeah. Does that question make sense? I hope I've paraphrased it correctly. No, no, you, no, no, that, 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 that is a very excellent question. I think, you know, what, what I would say is, uh, the whole, uh, whole business, uh, the entire supply chain, you know, all the way from upstream, all the way to downstream, uh, even into retail of the energy uh, uh, structure is, 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 is changing. Everybody is, is being impacted. I think, you know, just to put things in perspective, um, uh, the, the, the big, um, you know, seismic event that we just went through which is the COVID um, uh, impact on demand. You know, the world uses about 100 million barrels of oil every single day. Uh, when COVID came through, it knocked it down by, in April, by about 20 million barrels a day, 20%. It's the largest uh, disruption to uh, energy supply chains that has ever happened in terms of demand. And I think that those, uh, it's, not a, it's not going to be a V-shaped recovery. Uh, I think it's going to take a long time. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, construction companies are probably going to be um, feeling, feeling the brunt. I think a lot of service companies are going to feel the, the impact of it. Um, I know many of them are, uh, again, trying to transform themselves to become uh, digital companies of some sort, rather than offering uh, the kind of services that they traditionally have. So I think, you know, that's kind of what's going to happen to the entire supply chain. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. So uh, Sandeep, you live in 
uh, in Houston on the Gulf Coast, which has been impacted by a, a series of hurricanes this year. And uh, Vimal and I live here in Southern California, and we have been impacted by the you know, worst wildfire season in living memory. Uh, both of these are ostensibly driven by climate change. And so my question to both of you is that in the long run, if you look at the future of your companies, are you taking into account the impact of the changing climate and how will that affect your digital transformation long run? Well, I can answer that because I'm, you know, uh, we're, we're probably more uh, impacted by, by it. Um, you know, clearly, um, you know, we're in the fossil fuel business. Um, and I know several co conversations uh, have come about in terms of, you know, what is what is demand going to look like? Uh, there are a lot of prognosticators that, uh, that, you know, take a look at the business going out into 2040, 2050, uh, 2100. And so uh, one of the things that we do very extensively is, again, we use our supply chain of data the, 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 the fabric that we have built to really understand uh, demand for our products at a very granular basis. For example, um, one of the biggest things that is happening, which is transformative, is the electrification of the supply chain of energy, whether it's in electricity production uh, through renewable sources, whether it's in transportation through EVs, um, and, and really, uh, there are technologies that are even um, just about uh, to come about, which really have more to do with uh, where hydrogen will play a part in the entire um, you know, solutions for energy. Um, so the way we take care of uh, you know, where demand is going to be for us is really uh, a very, very granular understanding of where our demand sectors are and how they might be changing and then responding to that. Thank you. Thank so for you. us, there is, um, uh, sorry, if you just quickly, I'll yeah. mention that from a, we don't, we, you know, we, are, we make musical instruments for the most part and uh, mixing consoles and things like that. The, one of the key ingredients or the key materials that we use is wood. And uh, so, uh, and that more, a lot of the lumber comes from the United States, probably some of the stuff that burned down. So we, what we have done, it's not, what we have done and for, as, at the corporate level is uh, try to replenish the forests, planting trees and things like that. But other than that, I mean, we don't have a huge carbon footprint. So uh, it's difficult for me to imagine at this point what climate change will do to the consumption of our products or even to the manufacture of our products. Got it. And I have another question for you, Vimal. Uh, this mm -hmm. comes from Gaurav in Chicago, who uh, works for BP. And he says, you know, is it conceivable that uh, we will start using more and more virtual musical instruments, uh, such as the Microsoft HoloLens and Lenovo's Think Reality? And what will these virtual instruments do to the uh, business such as, such as yours? Right, well, uh, will we use, um, we already have, um, we already have musical instruments that are basically FM, synthesized music coming through on uh, uh, on your PC or your Mac. We have, we actually manufacture software that will allow you to take existing music and create new music out of it. Um, the, the demand for acoustic, not just acoustic, but also electronic musical instruments is, um, it's actually, you're right, it is actually going down, but that's mostly because we haven't driven, maybe there is a better way to market those instruments and as I, as I said, during the pandemic, what we found is that the demand for the hard musical instruments, not the virtual ones, but the hard musical instruments has gone through this, is gone through the roof because people are beginning to, they're spending so much time at home that they're, they're rediscovering the joy of playing a musical instrument. Our, uh, I'm sure there will be a balance reach. There are people who will be using virtual musical, creating music on a computer. We, we are in that business too. And uh, there are those who will continue to use acoustic instruments and electronic instruments. And they will be able to take the technologies that we have in place now to play music together with their friends uh, at a remote location. So we are part of all of that evolution. 
it's not something that is being ruled out by us. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to address the audience briefly here. So if you had sent your question in a while ago, we've been getting quite a long stream of questions. And if there's something burning in your mind that I have missed, uh, please don't hesitate to post it again. And I will try and see if I can address it or bring it up to the, uh, to the speakers. So uh, uh, do me that favor if you have something that uh, you feel is important and has not yet been addressed. I can only take some of the questions that are coming up. So please don't take it personally if your question doesn't get asked. I'm going to request at the end whether the speakers can, can share their uh, LinkedIn IDs or whether we can share their LinkedIn IDs and maybe you can take something offline with them. Uh, but uh, there's still plenty of material here to cover. So Sandeep, you talked about the electrification of the supply chain uh, of, you know, in your business. Uh, I see both in India and in the United States, uh, and particularly here in Southern California, that the whole movement towards electric vehicles is, is going very, very fast. And Southern California seems to be the center for electric vehicle innovation, uh, whether it's buses or trucks or, or cars or scooters uh, or batteries, you name it. And uh, several people are asking questions around, you know, what happens when the need for oil diminishes to the point where it's not a significant player in mainstream industry anymore? Uh, what will that do to the future of companies that are in the fossil fuel business, whether it's ExxonMobil or Conoco or, you know, or uh, Occidental or, or, or your company? Sure. Uh, what, what kind of transformation do you see yeah. happening? Okay. So, you know, one of the things that is, uh, that, that maybe we should define is, uh, you know, fossil fuels fairly broad. Uh, so you've got a lot of coal being manufactured. You've got a lot of natural gas being manufactured. Of course, you've got crude oil being manufactured. Um, coal is on its way out uh, in the supply chain in any case. You know, the only, uh, the only country where coal is uh, still, coal plants are still um, uh, being built in a very fast and furious manner is China. And again, they have a lot of resource. Um, so, so, you know, the, all of these uh, uh, fossil fuel sources will have their own journey. Uh, I think coal will obviously be taken out of the generation stack first. Uh, natural gas will continue to take market share from coal in the, in the generation of electricity. Um, but let me, let me talk about oil for a quick second and, and talk about really how oil is used. Um, out of 100 million barrels of oil that get used today, only about 60% of that, only about 60 million barrels is used to move people and things around, whether it's in cars, whether it's in trucks, whether it's in planes, whether it's in ships. And that's where uh, a lot of electrification is coming in. But there's a lot of oil that is used in petrochemicals. It's very difficult to displace that. Um, you know, and petrochemicals will continue to grow because they're used everywhere. You know, I'm looking at you, Gunjan, uh, the chair that you're sitting in, the headphones that you're, you're, you've got on, the shirt that you're wearing, you know, a lot of this comes from, you know, petrochemical use. So uh, the flowers that you've got in the back. So, so you know, I, I think in life, uh, there are a lot of uh, uses of, of hydrocarbons that perhaps, you know, are difficult to displace. The, the area where we're going to be maybe displacing uh, hydrocarbons first is going to be in cars, as you mentioned, electric vehicles. Now that is about 25 million barrels of oil a day out of the entire stack of 100 million. And again, uh, you know, right now, you mentioned, uh, you know, that uh, California is at the center of the universe. Um, on an annual basis in the world, passenger cars, uh, in 2019, 84 million cars were sold every year, are, are sold on an annual basis. Out of that, EVs were two. The most aggressive uh, uh, projections are by 2040, 20 years from now, we might be selling 55 million cars that are electric vehicles. But again, I think there's some, some challenges that the world has to overcome. The first has to do with making batteries for those cars. Again, uh, you know, the audience uh, needs to think about uh, when you make a battery, 
uh, you know, that technology is fairly old, although a lot of people are making a lot of changes to it, yeah. but it's an extractive industry. You need to extract lithium. You need to extract uh, cobalt. You need to extract nickel. And these are all open pit mines in very poor countries. Like the bulk of lithium comes from Chile. The bulk of uh, cobalt comes from the Congo. So, you know, you have to do that. And then once you have the battery, you then have to charge it. And uh, the bulk of the cars in 2040, if there are the most aggressive forecasts are 500 million EVs are going to be in the world in 2040, 200 of them are gonna be in China. And the generation of electricity in China in 2040 to power those batteries, the bulk of that is gonna come from coal, just because that's what they've got. Now in the United States, it's gonna be different. In Europe, it's gonna be much greener. But the world will move towards the electrification of different things at very, very different um, uh, rhythms. Uh, so, so it's a very complicated, uh, it's a very fascinating uh, journey that we're all going to take. And, uh, you know, I just want to tell everybody is, you know, that's the right thing to happen. You know, we, we absolutely need to reduce the emissions. It's just, it's going to, every country, every source of demand today will take its own little journey over the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years before we get to where we all need to get to. There's a question from Farooq Mistri, from Professor Farooq Mistri about the research that is happening at the IITs and how either of you might be interacting with the innovations happening, not only at the original five or seven or eight IITs, but now there's more than 20 of them. Uh, are either of you, uh, in contact with, uh, with uh, the faculty or researchers at any of the IITs? Can you share a little bit of that? I have, not been, uh, I have not been in contact, but that's something that would be very interesting to me for me to do, but I haven't been in contact yet as of yet. Yeah, and Sandeep? Yeah, unfortunately I have, uh, I have exactly the same, uh, same response. Um, it's, uh, it's something that uh, it's not right. We'll find a way to fix it. Yeah. yeah, so let me make a little bit of a pitch for that because in my daily work, I interact with uh, researchers and innovators in India and it has been amazing to see the amount of cutting edge work being done across the country, much of it at the IITs and I should say also much of it outside of the IITs. So we shouldn't feel like, you know, the IITs in India have some, uh, you know, broad claim on, on innovation and transformation. Uh, there's a bunch of work happening at organizations where you won't find a single IIT unemployed. Uh, but yeah, I would encourage both of you to take a look at uh, you know, not only you know, the IITs that you came from, but, uh, but all of the other IITs. Uh, uh, there's remarkable work happening at IIT Gandhi Nagar. I've heard of work at IIT Mandi. Uh, I have not visited Mandi, but I've been on the Gandhi Nagar campus and it's just amazing. And of course, our legacy IITs are, are doing tremendous work as well, uh, which you know, could potentially be of value to, to all, of the, all of those in the audience who are based here in the US. Now there's, a, there's some questions about AI and ML, and I had put that in the background only because that's a topic of conversation for pretty much any IIT conversation these days. Uh, but there's a tremendous move to try and make India uh, a, more, a more competitive player in the space of AI and ML. So I'd like to ask both of you, uh, you know, what, what are the gaps that you see within the AIML field that uh, companies or entrepreneurs in India might be able to fill for you? So let me, uh, uh, let me talk about that from, uh, 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 for Yamaha. What we did actually use some of the uh, open source ML algorithms to uh, the, 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 the premise that the hypothesis we were working on is that we had enough data in our systems about the purchase, purchasing sales history of our dealers to be able to predict what they might be buying, what, may be, what they may be interested in purchasing the next time they either call for placing an order or, for, uh, or with, if they enter it online on our, on our B2B system. So we, we worked on that hypothesis and, proved, and to prove it out, we came up with what we would call, we tried to predict the 12 most likely products that this that a dealer was likely to buy when they called in next time. And we found that we were able to use open source algorithms to 
open source machine learning algorithms to be able to come up with about a 60% uh, accuracy, we could predict within 60% accuracy of, of which 12 products are most likely to be purchased by the dealer when he's calling in. Uh, if you ask for what is what 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 improvements are necessary? I think you know those open source algorithms are open source algorithms that do not give us a competitive edge. If we were to create the the thing that we would like to do is create our own machine learning algorithms that are tailored to our own industry, our own business, our own uh, the way we do business, so that the predictability, predictable the predictions that come out of it are more accurate. So that's that would be what I would say are is one of our asks or one of our desires. Yeah, so Gunjan, we we um, we do a lot of ML. Uh, we don't really do AI, really. Um, you know, we, we collect such rich data streams on a real-time basis. Um, I've got about uh, a dozen data scientists that, uh, that uh, you know, are part of the IS, uh, IT group uh, at EOG. And so we do a lot of uh, algorithms ourselves, for example, we have our own um, uh, machine learning algorithms to detect potential leaks in uh, the vast pipelines that we've got that run our business. So that's you know a very very good part of our sustainability efforts. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, uh, algorithms, um, machine learning um, uh, tools that uh, that we've uh, developed that get continued uh, you know to be tweaked to understand where we might be running into challenges while drilling wells. And then uh, the machine learning aspect actually uh, is, is a very key part of our cybersecurity uh, infrastructure as well, so that we can understand where uh, things are going that are abnormal. And so most of the, uh, the, the, the technology that we're deploying is to learn what's normal uh, so that you know anything that is abnormal can be identified very quickly. So. So we, we have a lot of in-house machine learning uh, expertise that we deploy and we're Thank looking you. for more. So if there's, if there's one thing uh, from uh, all the various IITs, those would, be, those would be some things that we would be very, very anxious to, to consume, a lot of talent to help with machine learning. Awesome, okay. Well, this has been an, a terrific uh, Q&A session and, uh, and great uh, talks by both of you. I'm going to hand it back now to our host. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Sandeep and Vimal for, for, for your you. Uh, Thank you. expertise and your time. Thank you for having us.